reverse this part. So, <laughs> so this is ad living. To the University of Dayton, especially to my colleagues and friends in the Department of Religious Studies, I say thank you. Thank you most sincerely for selecting me as the 2017 recipient of the Mary Mist Award. I admit that in reviewing the list of previous awardees, I was truly humbled really to be among this important group of Catholic scholars. For several weeks now, I have been trying to come to grips with what it might mean to be recognized as making an outstanding contribution to the intellectual life. This award has been given to me, but it is not mine alone. Rare is that author, scholar, or theologian who generates an entirely new field or theory or interpretation. Rather, every author, every scholar, every theologian questions and researches, understands and judges, writes and teaches within an horizon, a field, a tradition, and hopes passionately through discipline and focus, creativity and patience, to contribute to the common fund of human knowledge from which she or he has learned. On this Feast of All Saints, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This award then honors my ancestors, my family, my teachers, my schools, especially Holy Ghost Elementary School in Detroit, Michigan, Boston College in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, my students over the past 30 years, my colleagues, and Catholic theologians, particularly men and women of indigenous, African, Asian, and Hispanic Latino descent, indeed all Catholic theologians who commit themselves to the difficult task of purifying ourselves and our culture, our society and our church, of the stains of indifference, exclusion, and militarism, of anti-Semitism, misogyny, heterosexism, Islamophobia, and racism. I want to also acknowledge already my family who is here, our cousins who are related through, we found this out because the wonderful Marianist, Joseph Davis, we learned that we were cousins in the midst of great turmoil, turmoil in the black Catholic movement and its second resurgence. And uh, it was a wonderful discovery and it's made from some wonderful times for us, so I'm very happy that you could take the time to be here. Everyone is busy, truly. So the trace of the cross, theology, and social suffering. There are three parts that really comprise this presentation. And first, a recollection of things past, of certain personal, existential, and religious experiences that challenged and nurtured my faith and the relevance of these experiences to my theological project. Traces of the cross of the crucified Jewish Jesus of Nazareth have exerted and continue to exert a formative presence in my life, and the cross is at the heart of my own theological project. Second, clarification of social oppression and the suffering that it causes in a society ordered by white racist supremacy and the marketization or unethical commercialization of human persons. This raises the issue of the ongoing daily crisis of human belonging, or whether the poor, no matter their race, the poor, the dark, the female, the old, the young, the physically flawed and mentally wounded belong to the family of humanity at all. And finally, some meditation on the vocation of the theologian and the cross of the crucified Jesus. So formative traces of the cross. 
My Catholic convert grandmother, Maddie Hunt Billingsley, would often tell the story that as my parents were bringing me home to, from the hospital, she took my newborn self in her arms and traced the sign of the cross over me and claimed for me the Catholic education that has shaped my worldview, my mind, and my heart. Of course, I was not and could not have been aware of this event, but I do recall at the age of four or five asking my maternal great-grandmother, Mary Hunt, about the picture hanging over her bed. Who is that man, I asked, hanging on the cross? And she replied, Jesus. Jesus who loves you and died for you. That crude but also effective representation of the crucified Jesus signified her own African-American Christian consciousness. It made room for an opening in my heart and cast a line of inquiry that stretches out to and from that depiction to the crucifix that hung on the wall in our living room, to the crucifix that hung above the altar in our small segregated Catholic parish church, to the crucifixes that, affixed, that were affixed to the walls of my elementary, secondary, and college classrooms, and to the crucifix that lies on my desk as I write. In the summer before I entered the seventh grade, <clears throat> I resisted my mother's idea that I attend camp. Yes. I registered for two high school courses, elementary French and a survey of world history. That summer history course confronted me with the foremost horror of modern times, the murderous attempt to destroy the Jewish people the final solution. This was new and genocide made no sense to my quite, not yet quite 12 year old mind. It was incomprehensible. But at some point, something clicked. I vividly recall standing in our kitchen, daydreaming, surely thinking about something quite ordinary when one of my grandmother's admonitions swam up in my consciousness. She often would say to me, remember, everyone can't like you. For an only child, that's a good admonition. <laughs> but on that summer afternoon, my grandmother's words crystallized as bitter and fragile insight. They gave me some, some glimpse of the meaning and reach of untrammeled power. And I formulated this hypothesis. If those who do not like you should hold power over you, then they can kill you. The disclosure of the brutality of genocide mocked all the lessons I learned first at home and then at school, that all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, are invested with great dignity, and all human beings are of enormous value and worth. That summer course awakened me to anti-Semitism, to the deadly consequences of xenophobia, to the social oppression and murder of other human beings simply because they existed. That tentative, intu that tentative hypothesis led to an intuition about the subversive potential of theology in and for society. Now, obviously, at that time, my grasp on the meaning and implications of such an idea were quite inchoate. But somehow, and for some unknown reason, the comments of my sixth grade teacher, Sister Mary Rosalie, comments she made about theology and theologians impressed me and seemed to suggest something more, perhaps even something daring. Already, I had begun to notice that the legal profession I preferred was subject to revision. Laws once passed could be repealed. Moreover, mere adherence to the law neither changes minds nor hearts. Theology might be a way to respond to oppression and the suffering it caused by prompting conversion of the hearts and minds of those who oppressed others. And somehow, that summer, I resolved to become a theologian. If I have told this story in other places, I tell it again here because I believe it is the truest affirmation of my own gift and call, my own theological vocation. 
The Second Vatican Council called the church to turn again to the fundamental duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and interpreting them in the light of the gospel in order to recognize and understand the world in which we live, its explanations, its longings, and its other dramatic characteristics. Moreover, with this deep commitment to human cultures, the Council opened space for the resurgence of the African-American Catholic tradition of struggle for human dignity and justice. Quite providentially, the Council coincided with those political and cultural struggles for freedom, human dignity, and human rights that were cresting around the globe and in our own country at that time. At that moment, in those moments, really, the very vicious intent of white racist supremacy in all its manifold and malevolent forms came into focus for me. And so the 1970s really found me reading and studying to understand the black life world more, more deeply, better, its cultures and yearnings and joys. It also found me studying liberation theology and black theology while staffing a national organization of black Catholic religious women. In 1976, I moved to New York and began work for the organization and process that was Theology in the Americas. And here I was inserted deeply and programmatically in the project of black theology. And the Reverend Donald Brooks, he called himself at the time Mohammed Kenyatta, he and I collaborated in organizing the first national ecumenical consultation on black theology. And there, thanks to Chilean priest Sergio Torres and Filipino Mary Knoll sister Virginia Fabella, I came to meet and know James Cohn and Gustavo Gutierrez. Graduate theological study was an obvious next step and Boston College has provided a significant setting. Here the cognitional and methodological proposals of Jesuit philosopher theologian Bernard Lonergan and the questions and categories of Johann Baptist Metz equipped me with tools and a paradigm through which to think rigorously about faith in relation to social oppression and suffering, to pay attention carefully to the suffering that oppression inflicted on the vast majority of God's human creatures. And at Boston College, the mind and faith and life of Frederick Lawrence taught me that theology is not so much a career as it is a vocation. Almost from the beginning of my theological project, and it has been and remains, the relation of theology's intellectual and spiritual praxis to the violation of human persons and their flourishing in ecclesial, social, and political contexts. The thematization, thematization of theology as political or political theology in light of the memoria passionis and finally, a critical interrogation of the black experience in service of formulating a Catholic theology in and from African-American perspectives. For much of the past 30 years then, the religious and existential, cultural and social experience of peoples of African descent in the US has served as a starting point for my theology. Yet that experience, black experience, is neither so particular nor so, new, so unique as to escape universal relevance. The exploration, expropriation, and greed that in the wake of colonialism spawned the cruel commodification and racialization of people of African descent, the devaluation and objectification of women and men who are, in the Im who are made in the image of God. But we can ask, does not shared human nature and common human experience teach us that every human creature at some point will meet with some measure of suffering and sorrow, some pain and loss? And is not the demand of Christianity, the radical indissolubility of love of God and love of neighbor? To paraphrase Metz, there can be no suffering in the world that does not concern us. So social suffering and theology. Despite the increased privatization and growth of the prison industrial complex, 
the continuing escalation of rates of incarceration, particularly among black and Latino men, the criminalization of poverty, and corrosive rejoinders to migrant, refugee, homeless, mentally ill, abused, disabled, jobless, hungry, paroled and released poor, white, and dark children, women, and men. We continue to believe in the American dream. Despite all this, former US President Bill Clinton once said, if you work hard and play by the rules, you should be given a chance to go as far as your God-given ability will take you. We all believe this. We insist that we each pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. That hard work and natural ability ensures success, and luck has nothing to do with it. Poverty, hunger, homelessness, lack and poor education, ill health, joblessness coalesces as the fate of those who are lazy, who lack willpower, discipline, and commitment. But consider Consider the concentration of wealth. 47% of the country's financial wealth, our country, is owned by 1%, the top 1% of our population, and 70% is held by the top 5%. Consider that household income is also concentrated with the top 5%, receiving 49.8% of all household income, while the bottom 20% of household in the U.S. had total incomes of less than 3.4% of that total. Women compose 57% of the population living below the poverty line. Consider the concentration of poverty. Whites concentrate the majority of the poor at 45%. But the probability of being poor follows racial, ethnic, and gender lines. According to the figures used by the US government, statistics from the previous decade indicate that 12.6% of the US population, 34.6 million, nearly 35, fell below the federal poverty line. In 2011, that was $22,350. An additional 26 million people live at the edge of the poverty line. It's an enormous percentage of people live at the edge of the poverty line. Children account for nearly 40% of those in poverty, although they are only 24.8% of the total population. Hispanic Latino children, their, pilot, their child poverty rates are 10 percentage points above the national average. The national average is roughly 16.6%. Uh, that rate is 27.8%. Income inequality in the US, the proportion of the richest tenth to the poorest tenth is greater than income equality in India. And elderly Hispanic Latinos are twice as likely to live in poverty as the general elderly population. Someone asked today, uh, the relation between sociology and theology. Maybe these statistics tell us where God is with the poor. Maybe they tell us where God is, which is why theology needs to spend some time thinking about those statistics, to meet God in the poor. These statistics, and there are many others, signal just how our cultural and social context is shaped by widespread economic deprivation, racial ethnic humiliation, and gender discrimination by oppression. These statistics fuse as social suffering. Social suffering refers really to a human problem. This is a human problem. It denotes those ways in which the intentional design of oppression in society inflicts suffering, concrete suffering, hunger, lack of health care, homelessness, anxiety, and anguish on human persons in a given social order. 
What happens to human persons happens to human persons within and often because of a social setup or social arrangement shaped in the trajectory of historical, religious, cultural, and social institutions, structures, and patterns. The political philosopher Iris Marion Young critically enlarges our understanding of social suffering by turning a lens on liberal or neoliberal capitalist societies like our own. Justice, she argues, should not be restricted to distribution alone, but ought to include those, quote, institutional conditions crucial for the development and exercise of individual capacities and collective communication and cooperation, close quote. Justice ought to be concerned about and directed toward augmenting and sustaining cultural and social structures and fostering capacity building for the realization of human flourishing. Young deploys the notion of oppression to, quote, designate the disadvantage and injustice. Some people suffer not because of a tyrannical power coerces them, but because of the everyday practices of a well-intentioned liberal society. Oppression in this way is structural. She writes, its causes are embedded in unquestioned norms, habits, and symbols, in the assumptions underlying institutional rules and the collective consequences of following those rules. It names an enclosing structure of forces and barriers which tends to the immobilization and reduction of a group or category of people. In this extended sense, oppression refers to the vast and deep injustices that some groups suffer as a consequence of often unconscious assumptions and reactions of well-meaning people in ordinary interactions, media and cultural stereotypes, and structural features of bureaucratic hierarchies and market mechanisms, in short, the normal processes of everyday life. This is our life, our everyday life, not someone else's, but our everyday life, our assumptions, our reactions. We are all well-meaning. What we hear and see on media, the cultural stereotypes that we hang on to, the normal processes of everyday life, Young cautions that structural oppression cannot be eradicated through the removal or recall or impeachment of those elected to legislate or govern, nor can structural oppression be eliminated through passing laws or amending others. Rather, these oppressions are structurally reproduced and disguised in our major cultural, political, economic, and religious institutions and in our electoral, legislative, and even in our dissenting procedures. Social oppression and thus social suffering take concrete form in what she identifies as economic exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. Given the asymmetrical dynamics of power, the category of social suffering clarifies positional suffering, that is, the humiliations of invisibility and indifference, of individualizing and relativizing, of distancing and distorting so that suffering may be disregarded, demoted, and dismissed. Oppression then refers to structural or systemic phenomena that immobilize or diminish, reduce individuals to particular or specified groups, reducing them with essentializing and arbitrary attributes. Structural or stemic oppression stands as a cruel experimentation on what Bernard Lonergan once called the quivering body of humanity. Francis of Assisi is reported to have said that the cross is a book. When we open that book in love and intelligence, we encounter its traces in the lined and heart-rending faces of homeless children, women, and men. In the myths, stories, and legends that recite the hope of indigenous people. 
their struggle for dignity and thriving. We read it and encounter it in the joy of fiesta and festival, in the midst of doubt and fear. In the tragic and tragically true accounts of women and men driven mad and addicted by abandonment. Yet the most intense experiences of social suffering <clears throat> resist determinism. Resist the determinism of oppression and cling to freedom. For freedom comprises that essential constituent of human being, of being human, even as, as its effective exercise occurs within limitations of time and place, condition and circumstance, talent and training. If the cross is a book, it is a book that a liberating theology of social transformation or a political theology must read and study. To take oppression as a point of departure for doing theology is to advert to perhaps even recover that paradigm shift in theology that Edward Skilovic termed theology after a history of Christian domination and victors. Theology then in this paradigm risks encounter and engagement with the dynamic and purifying powers of God in history even before we are completely liberated. Thus the incarnation, the concrete, powerful, paradoxical, even scandalous engagement of God in history changes forever our perception and our reception of one another. The Jewish Jesus of Nazareth forever changes our perception and reception of the human other. Our perception and reception of one another, of humanity. For humanity is his concern, neither merely nor incidentally. Rather, humanity is his concern comprehensively, fully. It is for the full and complete realization of humanity for our full and complete realization that he gave his life. A political theology or a liberating theology of social transformation in this context, our context, must stand squarely before the cross of the crucified Jesus, which is a most mysterious meeting place of grace and freedom. His cross is the concrete example of self-transcending love. And it is before his cross that the praxis of the Christian community must always be judged. For his cross exposes our pretense to personal innocence or to neutrality. This cross uncovers the poverty as well as the potential of all human efforts and solutions to resolve the problem of evil. The cross then of the Jewish Jesus calls us to conversion, to radical transformation of life for life. For the cross of the Jewish Jesus teaches us that conversion of life is not something which we speak. Rather, it is, despite all the consequences, that for which we struggle daily to live. For lived conversion of heart, mind, and action is not what someone else must do, but who we must become. So it is in our social disorder, not some other, that anti-Semitism, anti-black racism, misogyny, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, violence, economic exploitation, homophobia, obtain in our social order. It is our consciousness that is permeated with these disgraces, not someone else's. The cross really evokes our integrity. It calls us to a new responsibility for one another and calls us to entrust our lives to each other and to the dangerous Jesus. Theology then cannot, must not, shall not remain silent or complicit before the, before the suffering of a world crucified, before the suffering of peoples crucified. And when that theology comes face to face with the historical reality of social oppression and the enormous suffering inflicted upon God's human creatures, it must name explicitly the physical, the social, and existential damage, the oppression effected through structural or social, personal or individual sin. 
And it is a challenge of that theology then to work out the relation between the murderous crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth and the murderous crucifixion of countless poor, excluded, despised children, women, and men. To quote Metz again, the traditions to which theology is accountable know a universal responsibility born of the memory of suffering. So the cross and the vocation of the theologian. If the cross is a book, it is a book that must read and teach the theologian. If we read the book, if we read the cross, the cross must read us, must teach us. Theology then is a calling, it's a vocation that obliges mediation of God's word in a given time and place and circumstance. And as a vocation requires all our attentiveness, intelligence, reasonableness, responsibility, love, and passion. As a vocation, theology entails, as well, love and passion for the world. For the created world is the self-expression of divine love. We theologians are invited, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to participate in the mission of the promulgation of the mystery of salvation. To carry out the command of the gospel effectively, then, the church is urged to insert itself fully into the concrete circumstances of various peoples, just as Christ, by his incarnation, committed himself to the particular social and cultural circumstances of the women and men among whom he lived. Certainly, Christian contemporary, theologi certainly, cr contemporary Christian theological witness demands of us a thoroughgoing grasp of our own historical, social, and cultural condition. Our theologizing, then, is an act of critical interpretation of the gospel. We aim to offer both responses and challenges to questions that confront our faith. And our work as theologians constitutes an integral part of obedience to the command of Christ, for men and women cannot become disciples if the truth found in the word of faith is not presented to them. So it is, that, it is to that that we give assent, that is, to the word of faith. We give our full assent to the exigencies of research and argumentation, to the obligation to be critical, to interrogate all the presuppositions and conditions that account for doctrinal or social or cultural findings. Our theological vocation is shaped by church and society. For our theologizing is never, as Ignacio Eucuria has asserted, some mere autonomous theoretical undertaking. Even as our theology places itself at the service of the gospel that has been entrusted to the church, it can never acquiesce to the church as an end in itself or relinquish its spirit-given prophetic and critical age. At the same time, our theology cannot admit simplistic appeals to the reign of God. To quote Ayo Korea again, it is necessary to determine the place in which the truth of the reign of God is most accessible. Close quote. Inasmuch as that determination is to be made before the cross of the Jewish Jesus, our theology must stand at the foot of the cross with oppressed children, women, and men in our own social context and in the two-thirds world. Our theology, then, must repudiate all those principalities and powers of society and resist their efforts to, su to seduce it and to, su sorry, repudiate all those in in intentions to seduce its inspirited, prophetic, critical, and creative impulse. We all do theology because we want to collaborate in a most fundamental way in bringing about a different kind of world in the here and now. Our contribution to this project is to think about that world in light of the eschatological future that only God can give to us. We advocate for the reign of God. Our ultimate commitment can never be to a system or structure, person or group, church or university, but only to the God of Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus' prophetic praxis in the face of brute suffering, expendability, and certain destruction that demonstrates for us the risk and meaning of a life lived in prayer, compassion, solidarity, and hope.
I want to conclude really with just, just a few more words on this Feast of All Saints. In what I think many of us feel is a sadly gray and grim and gloomy moment in our nation and in our culture, we must, as the old spiritual councils, keep our lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. In this sad, gray, and grim and gloomy moment in our nature and our, in our nation and our culture, when casual cruelty, resentment, madness, and hatred defames and demeans, chokes and assaults, shoots and destroys, criminalizes and incarcerates, deports and demonizes children, women, and men simply because of their existence, simply because, because of their poverty, their gender, or sexual orientation, or race, or age, or cultural ethnic identity, or religious practices, we theologians must protest the social oppression and suffering of the word incarnate in each human person. We must take on the obligation to tell the truth about white racist supremacy. As critical understanding and interpretation of the social order for the sake of conversion and divine transformation, theology then must become black theology. In solidarity, we must take up the cause of the abject oppressed. We must enter into the drama of God's liberation. If we do this, we shall have taken up what James Cone named the risk of freedom. And that risk sets us squarely down in front of the cross of the crucified Jewish Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you very much. Social oppression is social sin. It's the result, suffering, social suffering, or suffering in a given social order, either through economic exploitation or cultural imperialism or powerlessness or uh, violence. Those are sins. It's what we do with each other. And I had a, a, a good conversation this morning with the first 1010 class about that. These are sins against the neighbor. These are sins against the neighbor. They're sins against uh, the great commandment, huh? To love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So, so these really are, these are sins which are really sins of idolatry as well. I prefer myself to the word of God. I prefer myself. And we found a way to incorporate all this into our culture, not just here, not, not just in the United States, but in many other places in the world. Huh? We found a way to make it, make it palatable to ourselves. And that's, that's our struggle. We're trying to figure out how, we ask ourselves, how do, how do we get to this place? How do we get to this place? And we're trying to figure out. I think that's, it's very important that we're trying to do that. But that's what that is in the end. This is what I, maybe it's a reduction, but I think it's a real distillation. Distil, distillation. It's, it's a kind of uh, bringing it together in a very intense point. I think that's what it is. It's a sins against, these are sins against the neighbor. You know? They occur in society. 
They are disguised in society. We, we, we were saying this morning, I mean, again, one of the great challenges for us as Americans is that we've made poverty a moral ill. It's a moral ill. It's moral. That you, don't, that, that you can't use your food stamps to buy certain things is your fault. So we overlook the, the, the long list of rules and regulations that we've, we've attached to this. We've overlooked the long, the long list, the long list. We, we created those rules, we can change them. We can change them. And we can change. But it requires, uh, it will require a lot from all of us. A lot from all of us. I think that racism has taken on a new face in this country in the last couple of years. Mm. And if so, uh, how would you describe it and, and how should we respond to it? Well, I'm calling Jesus tonight. I <laughs> <laughs> You're very serious, and I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive at all, uh, Professor Doyle. Um, black people probably would say racism really hasn't changed, is that white people have become more aware of it. White people have become more aware, aware of it. Newscasters have been using the word racism. And it, it, what has become clearer is that those wonderful iPhones I was you know, criticizing this morning, I have mine out there somewhere, uh, those wonderful iPhones have, have allowed people to take um, you know, videos of police brutality. It's, not, it's never all the police. That's not the point. It's not all the police. It never is every individual police officer. But what it, what it captures are those people who feel that they can use their authority with impunity because of X. And so I think, I think what, what is true, and it's, it's a good thing that this has happened, that white people have become aware. And it's a good thing that people are fighting back against white privilege, yes. Because, because having to admit that we have certain privileges, and all of us in this room, all of us in this room, every single person, we are really privileged. We're exposed or have or are getting a university education. The vast majority of the world doesn't have that. So the question would be, from a Catholic point of view, how do I use my gift for good? That's, that's the point, that's what, that's what it means. To be fully alive is to contribute to the common good. Huh? So that people have begun to recognize that there's a problem is really important. But, but has it changed? I think most black people would say it hasn't changed. Not that, not that any black people in here have to answer, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's the kind of thing that because of its visibility, means now that things that were hidden before or you could not really uh, discuss with evidence are now available to us. The danger here, of course, is that by continuing to video these events, they become just another event, just another event. But that's someone's life, someone's daughter, someone's son, someone's uncle, brother, sister, mother, cousin, niece. So I think, I think to, if we can learn as much as we can about one another, but also to examine our own consciences, each one of us. Each of us has something to examine in his or her conscience about our relational behavior, both at a, um, an aggregate level and individually, because we never live alone. These things are possible because someone supports it or allows it or thinks it's funny. Or someone thinks that sort of remark is, you know, oh, they, they didn't really mean it, it was just a prank. But for people who experience it, it is not a prank. You know, it's not a joke. It, it's, a, it, it's fear. It's fear. So, so I, think, I think this is important. I think it's important that young people, uh, particularly young white students, you're learning a lot. 
I think that the involvement that we see nationally in uh, various kinds of movements demonstrate a deep willingness to learn. Younger and younger, our, our younger theologians have begun, to, at least Catholic ones, have begun to turn greater attention to this. And that's really important. That's really important. So, yeah. Yes. Are you a student? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I was wondering, why do you think religion has divided people based on race or beliefs when there's originally, like, in the Bible, so much forgiveness shown by God to the Jews who, who crucified his son? Why does religion split races and different beliefs over time rather than bringing them together? And God has shown so much forgiveness. He's mm -hmm. supposed to be all forgiving. Why is religion divided? Well, this is a great question. It's a perennial one, and it's good to bring it up here. And, and, and here's the, the thing. Um, the first thing, of course, is that the Romans are the people who crucified Jesus. Huh? The Jews are subject people. They're subjugated. They're conquered. You can have the Roman garrison right next to the temple, uh, a profoundly holy place in, in ancient Israel, uh, thinking about uh, the, the presence of the divine that it should become embodied there for, as a spirit. You know, the cloud descends. And so so uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is, it, is that what you're on to, I think, is that this dimension of religion, it's human and it's divine. The divine dimension of religion has no problem. God is not, God has no respecter of persons. God loves all of creation. God would not have created if God didn't love. This is the overflow of divine love. But we, for whatever sets of reasons we can come up with, are problematic to ourselves and to one another. Whether it's competing envy, whether it's fear, I tend to think it's fear. We're afraid someone will get something that I won't. And how do I get it? How do I get it back? How do I prevent them from getting more? This, this is really, this is our issue. It's not God's issue. Religion, in, in a real way, as an organized human endeavor, is the problem, not the divine. It means then that religion has to take a, a kind of different view of itself, all religions, that they're not, a, it's not about, religion in and of itself is not an end. It's a means to divine worship. It's a means to divine love. But we've made it an end. I can keep all the laws. I can wear all the right things. I can have all these. You know. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. OK. This is a person's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, OK. Last two, and then we'll go. Dr. Copeland, what's inherent in our Catholic institutions that those who teach, those who preach, shrink from the responsibility for forming community? Mm. This is, this is another good question, you know. <laughs> it's like, it's like over here, I'm, I'm continuing to call Jesus, you know. I, I think really, you know, the Catholic Church is a human institution. It's, it's our church. It's our church. That means that as baptized members, we have responsibility for it. So if it's not working, then we need to do something. That's, that's the point. And so we need to stand up and say, we don't want to behave like this anymore. We find it inimical to what we read in the gospel. It's our responsibility, not someone else's. We, we, you know, this particular pope, um, he's not the only one. There have been others. But this particular pope is trying very hard to teach us something about how to relate to one another. Very hard. You know, to say, we, we did this today, I mean, to say that the church is a field hospital it, it means that he gets it, that the world is in big trouble and we should be rushing out to do something, not whacking each other. But, but the thing would be, you know, um, we have to also understand that there are also problems within the field hospital, you know. So, so we have to figure, we, have to, we can't spend all our time worrying about ourselves, but we have to get out there. But we also have to think about how, how do we make ourselves a, a, a good witness to the mercy and joy of God. How do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Bill? Last, last person here? Wow. <laughs> no, you're not the last person. So the, uh, the 
thing that the word that you said that grabbed me since I'm a theologian was that we have to make theology black. Black theology, yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of graduate students of theology over here. So I, I'm asking you this because I think you did this before it was cool. So, so, like, <laughs> so, how, so what would you tell them? How would you advise them to make theology black and navigate their way through various theological establishments that might not like that? Yeah, yeah. I really think that, okay, I really think that by saying that, what I'm saying is that it's what we devalue. It's what we devalue. So we have to pay attention to whoever and whatever is devalued in society. Turning our attention to the people who are left out, wherever they are, wherever they are. There's a, there's a, there's a way in which, uh, by saying that also, I mean, paying attention to what is, um, well, okay, to what, to what we think of as most abject. If, if police can, some police, it's not all police, it's not all, okay? If some police can decide that black lives don't matter by behaving very badly, then how do we say, yes, all lives do matter? And so do these lives. And why are we saying that? Because they seem to be most at risk at the moment. They seem to be most at risk at the moment. It could be that there, there will soon be, we would hope not, other people whose lives are at risk. And if we think right now, there, there are. I mean, we want to put up a wall to, you know, to, that's going to be how many hundred feet tall and how many to protect us from Mexico, you know. No, I mean, no, there are bids on the wall, huh? There, there are bids on the wall. So how do we do it so that we begin to, to understand that all life matters? And it matters concretely because we don't turn out, we're not, we're not born aracially. We're not born asexually. We're, we're born in, we come into the world in this way. You know, we can say through no fault of our own. But, but we are here. And how do we make this a hospitable place? So in, in that way, then yes, not, not by saying I'm doing black theology and anybody can do it. We're not saying that, but we're asking people to reflect on that experience and what does it teach you? What does it teach you? Reflecting on that experience. We reflect on all sorts of things. We never worry about German theology. We read German theology and we have a great defense for it. We get out there, we understand it, we dig right into it, we're, there we go. Well, we can figure out how to do this and do it with a certain amount of regard for the asymmetry of our relationships in this particular place, indeed around the world, around the world. I think, I think truly in, in this way that, that um, there's, there's so much needed for all of us. There's so much work to do to think about how we actually you know, could live together. You know, it's sort of, you know, Rodney King, however many million years ago, this just came to me, he's just like, can't we all get along? Well, yes, we could, if we could all pay attention to each other with careful, critical attention. You know? I mean, we're facing this whole issue of uh, deporting people. I mean, wow, ouch. I mean, are we thinking, thinking about that? Are we thinking about that? I, I, think, I think it's a it's a really serious concern for us intellectually, not to just be not to be casual about our theology, but to be deeply serious because it's connected to the world. It's connected. How does God's word get mediated into the world? That's one of our tasks and one of our responsibilities. It's not, it's, it belongs to other people as well, but it certainly belongs to theologians. It certainly belongs to us. <laughs>